God has something to say to you, warning you against sin and promising you forgiveness through his son, Jesus Christ. I am Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. And as I do every time we get together, I like to say uh, welcome. Uh, indeed, uh, welcome to our worship services, Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30. And this is the Bible study that I am hosting. We're on the YouTube Sundays at 9.30. You can find it at trinitydelray.org. Join us if you are in the neighborhood of Delray Beach, Florida. We're located at the corner of Lake Ida and Swinton in Delray Beach. We're in the book of Malachi, as I think all of you know, the last book of the New of the Old Testament. And this book is what someone has called God's last word. No, his last word is his son, Jesus Christ. Malachi chapter three today, God is speaking and he says, behold, boy, there's an exciting word in the Bible. Behold, and lo, I send my messenger. I want to put before you a brief outline of Malachi chapter three, and it goes like this. Part one, I will send a refiner to purify the sons of Levi. I will judge my people and I call my people to repent of robbing me, robbing me. I call my people to receive my abundant blessings. I call my people not to speak against my will. Now there is a very prominent and present thought in our land today. And I call my people to believe my promise. I will keep them as my treasured possession. Treasured possession. And that phrase comes up when Peter writes one of the two letters. I believe it's first Peter. God's treasured possession. That's what you are. He bought you with the blood of his son. That's how we know how much God treasures each one of us. And here's the first verse of chapter three. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way. He will prepare the way before me. So here's a fill in the blank question for you all. And uh, you can all answer it once, but only <laughs> with, with Zoom, there's only one, one voice gets through. It's usually the first one. Uh, how do you fill in the blank? My messenger who came to prepare the way before me, before the Lord is? Elijah. Elijah, that's, <laughs> do you know why you said Elijah? I have, a, I have a little note I wrote when I've been here before. <laughs> well, it's Elijah in a way. I wondered if anybody knows why. Uh, it just says he's the connection to the New Testament because many thought John the Baptist was right so, right yeah, that's and what, what I right anybody else oh is it all part of the lineage of god in the history in a way in a way okay. uh-huh jesus said of john the baptist he is elijah hmm. if you can accept it and he isn't literally elijah he isn't John the Baptist was not what Herod thought, Elijah risen from the dead. Okay. Okay. But so who is the messenger in, chap in verse one? I've already told you. Elijah. Who? Y you said Elijah. And that's not quite the answer. Who is the who is John, the, John the Baptist? John the Baptist, correct. John okay. the Baptist is okay. That's what I thought to yeah. begin with. Yeah, me too. All right, all right. Okay, now, this is John the Baptist. Uh, is he of whom it is written, "Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you." 
so that connection is made uh, by the New Testament. Okay, okay, and th there's another part to verse one. Would someone read, beginning with "and the Lord," Judy? Um, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to His temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, He is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Here's my question. Mm. And the Lord who came suddenly, or so it seemed, to his temple is I don't know. Guesses are good. Isn't it Jesus? It's Jesus. Yes. Right. And <laughs> when he came to the temple at, at the age of twelve, they were surprised but they didn't know who he was. Later on, at about age 30, he began his ministry, and he came suddenly to his temple, and they were annoyed, and they refused to accept that he was the Messiah. Now, the word suddenly is what it seemed like after 400 years of silence and no word from God, no prophet spoke, from 400 BC until Jesus came on the scene, the word was made flesh and began to dwell among his people. And he came suddenly. I looked uh, and looked and looked at the other translations and I said, there's got to be one of them who, who doesn't say suddenly. And they all do. <laughs> I couldn't find another translation. I thought that couldn't be the right word there because it doesn't seem like he came suddenly. It did to the people. Yes. And question number three, he, that is the Christ. That's not a question. <laughs> that's a statement. He is a messenger of the covenant. And what covenant is that? Uh, grace? Uh, faith. Oh, no, grace. Are you, are you talking like the Isaac? The, there was an old covenant, and this was the new covenant. And it was announced in uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. Hmm. Oh. Uh, pastor spoke of it in a sermon a couple of weeks ago. Oh, he was distinguishing the covenant. The old covenant isn't that, was announced. Isn't that the one? Uh, uh, you know, I'm having trouble with the word, but um, uh, in the upper room where they took the um, the blood and the and the uh, and the bread. Um, All right. So in the Lord's Supper, in the Leah, he says, okay. "This is the blood of the covenant of the new covenant." But what was the new covenant announced by Jeremiah? And it's, oh. it's something that you want to know. This. It's not something you have to know. I think every Christian ought to know that the new covenant is God's promise. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. Isn't that grace, Pastor? That's super grace. <laughs> super <You> grace? <laughs> that is the greatest news that anybody has ever heard. Because <clears throat> that's what I said first. Yeah. Jeremiah so, kept yes. Jesus is the messenger of the covenant. He doesn't seem like that. We don't often call Jesus the messenger. Jesus is also the message. You, right. you, you understand that he is both yep. the content and the deliverer. And he works it out by allowing himself to be crucified for the sins of the whole world. The new covenant is yours. It was given to you. Well, I'm going to push the button, and uh, if it works, <laughs> I'm going to go on. And um, who's next in? Um, I'm going to just take it down the line. Jamie, you're next on the. Uh... Okay. But who can endure the way the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refining refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. 
then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. So who can endure the day of his coming? Who's the, who's the his? That's Jesus Christ, right? Yes, yes. And who can stand when he appears? That's us. No one. No one, because of they all have sinned. Uh, that's exactly right. Hmm. I don't know why things are not working this morning. I checked the, uh, I checked the plugins. Well, this works. How is the Christ described here? A refiner. Yeah, a refiner. You're a fire. You know, fire. if you make soap out of lye and you wash a garment that is stained, mm -hmm. well, if the garment holds up to the lye, which is a problem, but if the garment holds up to the lye, that will bleach or, or wash out the impurities. And a refiner's fire, uh, think about silver, which has still mixed in with the silver, the ore that came in which the uh, silver was deposited by the Lord. Well, you have to melt it. And the dross, the, the part that you don't want in the silver is, is melted off and it has a different specific gravity now we're getting too scientific huh well the idea is is that you get rid of the impurities in the refiner's fire and that's what jesus does isn't it all right so he sits as a refiner and purifier and he will purify the sons of levi now who are the sons of levi um in the old testament Isn't the priests, yeah, the priests. The priests. The priests were among, but not all Levites were priests. All the priests mm -hmm. were Levites, as we studied in First Samuel several months ago. So you're right. He will purify them, and then when they bring offerings, they will be brought in righteousness. Now, that's not just a promise for the Levites of, of the 10th century BC. That is true today. There's something else is going on here that I need to explain. And that is, in the New Testament, we are all priests before God. You've heard that before, right? That's in First yes. Peter. And uh, we are a nation of priests because we can all go directly to God through the one mediator who is Jesus Christ. That's in first Timothy. Well, when we do that and we bring our offerings, whether they are money offerings or offerings of the work that we do, uh, the prayers that we pray, they are purified like gold and silver and they are accepted by the Lord because of Jesus Christ. He does all that purifying. We don't. We can't. Otherwise, what we brought would not be acceptable to the Lord. Not pleasing, as verse 4 says. So why do the sons of Levi, when this is spoken in the time of Malachi, now we're back to 400 BC, and it has been true for a few centuries before then, why do those sons of Levi need to be refined and made pleasing to the Lord? What was going on there? Malachi chapter one. Yeah. False prophets. They were false prophets. That's one of their problems. Uh, and weren't they like dirty sinners? So wouldn't they have to be remade? Um, their their sins uh, remained. Uh, but mm -hmm. what about the offerings they were bringing? The offerings were impure. Why? Right. They were bringing, yeah, uh, not bringing what? Not pure offerings. But they were bringing blemished offerings. Ah, the sheep and the other animals they brought were castaways. Uh, those who had died of a disease, they were blemished, and they were to, supposed to bring an unblemished lamb. 
prefiguring Jesus Christ, the lamb without spot or blemish. Right. So to refine and to purify is not to destroy. When Jesus comes to refine us and purify us, he doesn't destroy us, but he makes us clean and righteous. And the question I have of you is how does this happen? <laughs> By forgiving our sins. He right. Can. All right. And, and through the Lord's Supper. How are you made clean and righteous? Also through, also through our baptism. The baptism connects you with the death of Christ and with the resurrection of Christ. And your sins are washed away. His death on the cross and His resurrection. Death on the cross in your place. So your offerings, however you make them, it is not all about money, as you know. So this is how it happens. And it's God's work in us, not our work. We never mix our works with God's beautiful work of redemption. All right? I got you all on board here? Good. Now, I think we've already answered question four. How our offerings are made pleasing is through the life and death of Jesus Christ. We put our faith in him, and we have him as... Lord and Savior. We have faith in him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Here it says, we'll be pleasing to the Lord. You can't please the Lord with your offerings if you do not have faith in him and his promises. And I know you do. And this is why you can kind of uh, take have peace and not be concerned that you wouldn't have made right. pleasing offerings. And most of the time, and this is a good thing, most of the time you really don't think about that. You just do. You just give. You just love. You surround yourself with people who need your help, and you go after helping them in one way or another. Those are offerings to the Lord. Mm -hmm. he, doesn't, he doesn't forget them. You know, uh, there is a passage in the book of Revelation that I often have quoted when someone dies. And it's Revelation uh, 13, 14, or is it 14, 13? <laughs> it's one of those two. I uh, sometimes have to look it up to check it. And it is, and their deeds do follow them. Wait a minute. I thought we were saved by faith and not by works. Yes, but the Lord remembers your deeds. I think it's good for us to know that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, people, and I'm speaking rather personally, we, we're concerned that we don't get enough recognition. Mm -hmm. you no, know, and there's two people in a household, and I know most of you that are online with me today are, are living alone. But when you have a spouse, and you yeah. remember that, sometimes the guy wonders if... I think we're going to quit that. <laughs> uh, that's a personal problem. The Lord will judge his people. Uh, the next reader, well, they got to get mixed up. Ian, would you read uh, Malachi 3 5? Sure. Uh, right. Then. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I'll be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. And that's quite a catalog of, of sins, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. You want to list them? <laughs> What's a sorcerer? The sorcerers. What is a sorcerer? Anybody? Um, a magician of sorts. Uh-huh. With the magic spelled in a different way. Right. Is it like dark magic? Dark magic. Yeah, Those who 
Oh, you know, kids mess around sometimes with the Ouija board and they shouldn't because it is a false prophet to say my future will be predicted by the Ouija board. Don't mess around with false prophets, even if they seem to come true, even if they do come true. So would you say it's false prophets, number one? It is more than false prophets. It's the sorcerers who make a living. Um, within uh, two miles of our home, there's a sign that has been there for probably 40 years, and it tells me that I can go get my palm read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've never done that, though my dad used to point out what his lifeline looked like. Well, it was kind of interesting when I was your age, Ian, to have my, and I figured out later on what that is. See that lifeline? You know, the reason it's longer? Because you worked all your life and you used your hands. <laughs> and that crease became indelible, or um, uh, indelible is the wrong word. It became fixed. Uh, I don't know that medically, <clears throat> but it seems to be true that, <laughs> Those who work hard all their life, I'm getting on a tangent, aren't I? They, they <laughs> seem to live longer, uh, but I don't know that either. <laughs> they just seem to. Well, the adulterers are including those who uh, commit fornication because they are not married, but they want what they want. Swear falsely in a court or not. If you oppress the hired worker or the widow or the fatherless by not giving them what they're due or thrust aside. Anybody know what a sojourner is? Traveler. A traveler. A traveler. Hmm. A, a, drifter. a drifter. Pardon? A drifter. Not quite. Uh, it doesn't have a negative connotation. It shouldn't. So then homeless wouldn't be... Uh, no, uh, no not that. Although you shouldn't have... Plus aside, the sojourn. How um, about pilgrims? Uh, could be. Uh, give me an example of a sojourner. Have you ever been a sojourner? Yes, I think. Are you're, they... in country, you're in another country and you yeah. don't know. And Joanne was going to say what? Nothing. I thought I heard your voice. Just, just traveler is what I had said originally. You see, for two and a half years, uh, Jeannie and I and our children, yeah. we, we lived in Italy because the Air Force putting me there and brought the family with me. That was wonderful. And uh, every one of us had to carry every time we went out, like you carry a driver's license every time you go out. Well, we all carried a sojourner, which was a permission to be in that country, not just mm. as a tourist, but as a sojourner. And the piece of paper was called a sojournal or a sojournal. Mm. So we were sojourners and we were not thrust aside. Um, so, yes, yes. So like those, those that would not be a citizen of the country, but live that's right. The that's the, that's the distinction. Uh, Chris, you were going to say. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but I have, I'm not getting updates on your, your thing. It says the host has disabled screen share on my computer. Is that mm. possible? I don't think I did. I didn't. Uh, oh, listen, um, in other applications, in other uses of, of the Zoom application, mm -hmm. I can enable each one of you to share things on your screen for the benefit of everyone. And during this uh, teaching mode, no one else can share a screen except me, the teacher. And that's for to keep confusion aside. So that's nothing unusual, Chris, that you can't do it. You have you know? pictures on the side. And did you add numbers like two, three, and four to your list? Yeah. Well, I didn't get them. You didn't. Do you see no. a one up there now? Only the one. Okay. Well, that's, I haven't pushed the button yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Let's go on. Here's number two. 
to what extent are these sins very evident in our day? Oh, yeah. Sorry. No, it's all right. We're learning. Sometime you will host a Zoom, maybe. Just. <laughs> to what extent are these sins very evident now? In the police force, the way they treat black people, I mean, some policemen. Uh, and migrant workers and just a lot of different things that. It's rampant is what you mean, rampant. So all of these sins are are happening today. Well, the uh, against the adulterers, we see uh, many couples living together, many young people living together, um, older people living together and choosing not to get married, unfortunately, uh, anymore. Uh, I, I don't know what the population is. I did read a couple of years ago that there were over a million couples living together without benefit of marriage. Oh. Could talk oh. about that some other time, but it is one wow. of the sins. You know, and against those who swear falsely, well, that's only between, uh, I guess, our God and, uh, and man, but um, there's a lot of false inf information that is given uh, that we, I guess we have to fact check or we have to discern about as far as uh, everyday news and um, happenings. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I wanted to add that the sojourner thing or even just anybody out there, we are fearful in helping people because there's so many traps nowadays of people doing that just to um take advantage of you somehow and um you know even like the the people at the street corners wanting money um, you know fear can uh, fear can keep you from doing the right thing so you have the two poles yeah, uh, uh, yeah. pulling against you and that's something that you have to solve mm -hmm. i think it's something you can pray about I don't know. I am not going to tell you what to do or what not to do. Okay. Your ethics are in part determined by what you have been taught, right and wrong. But ethics is the application of what is true to your situation. I didn't say I was a situational ethicist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said it will impinge upon your willingness to do the right thing. I think I'm getting out of that dilemma okay there. <laughs> I'm thinking of, you know, the people that beg for food, uh, uh, you know, say that they need food who stand on the street corner. We, you know, we may fear giving money to them for what, for, you know, for what they're going to use it and that sort of thing, where we might do well in, in giving money or time and talent to a soup kitchen that feeds those those folks you make uh, it you make that choice yes we make we do make a choice in that respect i don't think the lord wants us to be reckless it's a discernment we have to make uh, now, you go to work on that today and you're going to work, work on it again tomorrow correct. it is a, a a constant thing yes and when you get up in the morning and you say your morning prayers you can include that lord help me today <clears throat> to love people in the way you would love them and keep me from evil in every instance. And I will trust you for the outcome. Uh, that's a prayer that you can pray. Well, uh, I only had two questions on that. Now I have a big long passage because I have to set up a, uh, a situation. Nehemiah um, prophesies, he's a prophet, and he is a little bit before Malachi. And Nehemiah has been spelled wrong. There's an, there's an e that I should be an e. an e. Okay. When you do something at the last minute, while you three of you were waiting to get on, I was putting this passage in there. So forgive me that spelling error. Okay. And uh, who is going to read? D, would you read this long passage? Can you see it all? 
Is it really Nehemiah 20? Because Nehemiah only goes up to 13. You're right. That's wrong, too. It's Nehemiah 10. I can't fix it on the screen now. Okay. It's Nehemiah 10, 35 to 39. Thank you very much. I know that <laughs> Nehemiah doesn't go that far. <laughs> I said it was, I was doing this at 10.02. <laughs> While at warp speed, huh? <laughs> yes, and I did not, uh, I didn't even push F7. Uh, oh, yeah. Come on, uh, 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 D, please For, read. Forgive it. <laughs> please read. We, we obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree, year by year, to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of the Lord to the priests who minister in the hours of our God. House. The first. The house. Oh, I'm sorry. In the house of our Lord. The firstborn of our sons and our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and all to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. And the priests, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. And the Levites shall bring up all the tithe of the tithes to the house of God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the son of Levi shall bring the contributions of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. Well, wow, that's a lot of words. Yes, it is. How would you sum that up? They promised to do what? To, to what? First fruits. First fruits. They right. will bring in their offerings. You notice there's not money at all uh, involved there? No, it doesn't say anything about money. Well, why was but that? Did they have money back then? Well, whether say. money existed is not the issue. Yes, they did. Uh, the Their Levites, how, how were the Levites who served in the temple of the Lord, how were they to make their living? They, uh, they, they, they were provided by these offerings is what uh, kept them alive. That was uh, how, uh, how they were kept. Right. Uh, they paid and paid. Now, you can make a connection to today's pastors and teachers and professional church workers and all the collection of people who serve in the house of the Lord. If the house of the Lord can be defined as all of the, of the nine acres of property at Lake Ida and Swinton. And I don't know what would happen if I brought the first fruit of my tomatoes. <laughs> Well, I didn't bring the first, uh, but uh, I brought a couple of bags. I couldn't feed everyone. I brought a couple of bags a couple of weeks, Jeannie and I did, to the house of the Lord. And I think they were delighted to enjoy with their families some very meaty, juicy tomatoes. And uh, But you see, they have other sources of income. And that is because you use actual money that you find some way of giving to the, to the church. But I want you to, the only reason I brought this up was not to discuss uh, how we do offerings today, but they were bringing these to the storehouse. You see that? They're bringing them to the storehouse. Now, I don't know what the shelf life was. I don't worry about that. I don't, I'm not even going to go into that. But I wanted to set this up from Nehemiah, spelled with an E, uh, 10, uh, to, to set up the fact that the people were robbing God. Mm. Um, okay. Make a comment, Pastor. Yes. Is, is it from Nehemiah where 
and I'm going to use two um, uh, races, or I don't know what you call them, Italian and Irish. Right. And if you look into those two uh, countries, let me put it that way, countries, um, a, a, it's almost like a history that the first son became a priest back in the old days. I know. And that continued in our country to some extent. I knew of that lineage that the firstborn son in some Lutheran families was automatically enrolled in a preparatory school to see if he could cut the mustard. That is, if he could learn the, the theology and the languages that were put before uh, they went away to a uh, high school boarding uh, boarding house or a boarding school, I should say. Mm -hmm. And one of those was in St. John's uh, in Kansas. Well, mm -hmm. they went away and if they uh, could cut the mustard, if they could do the work, then they went on to four years or at least two years of college and then the last two years of college. And then they would enroll in the seminary. The firstborn of every family was put there. It was just expected. And you can find families of the Missouri Synod where they go back four and five generations. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what a man do it if he had only daughters. <laughs> probably had parochial school teachers. I, I knew a man in, uh, in Texas that had uh, four daughters and then he, he, they tried again. And, and what if the Lord did bring forth another daughter and they mm -hmm. named her Paul? <laughs> oh no and then they had a sixth child and a boy was born uh mm -hmm. but he didn't as far as i know go into the ministry okay that's what you were bringing up and yes. it wasn't just italians or, or uh, irish it was a a um, it was a family tradition but mm -hmm. the new testament let me make this really clear the New Testament does not require that the firstborn of every Christian family go into the holy ministry. Yeah. Okay. I, not such a bad idea, but you know, the Lord distributes gifts to people according to his will. And well, yes, you understand? Yes. Okay. Now let's go on to the storehouse thing and the robbing God. Who hasn't read today yet? Well, you go ahead and read, please. For I and the Lord do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statues and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? You, yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Continue. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you, uh, devourer, devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Robbing God. Well, a dialogue goes on here. Uh, the book of Malachi has at least seven places where there is a dialogue simulated between the people and God. You know, the Lord speaks and the people um, answer and their answer was not mm, <laughs> was, was not acceptable to the Lord. They were speaking back. Uh, Ian, did uh, your parents have you have they taught you not to speak back to them? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Uh huh. 
I, I know that uh, when some of you were brought up, there was a penalty for speaking back and you learned to shut your trap when you were when you were ordered to do something or criticized for not doing something. And you came out with all those excuses and they said, I don't want to hear it. And uh, if you kept it up, I don't know uh, what kind of soap they used. Um, <laughs> soap was used to cleanse a mouth that had uttered uh, obscene words, uh, impure words. Well, let's go about this dialogue between the Lord and the people. The Lord says, return to me. And how did the people answer? Return. Yeah, how shall we return? Now, you have to figure out what does the word return mean? Worship God. You know, uh -huh. they're obviously not worshiping God. They're worshiping other things. Yeah, and they, they coveted that which they kept for themselves. But it was greater than that. Their sins, uh, they, they had a whole collection of sins, as we just read. So return is kind of the modern day equivalent or old equivalent of the modern day word called repent. Come back to me. I am the Lord. You have strayed from me. Return. Come on back. It's an invitation as well as a command. And they said, how shall we return? You get the attitude? Mm -hmm. They weren't asking a question. <laughs> they knew. And the Lord said, Will a man rob God? That's a rhetorical question. And then he tells them, you are robbing me. And the people answered, how oh, have we robbed you? Oh, boy. I mean, <laughs> don't you wish you had been there? <laughs> how have we robbed you? And he answers, in, the, in your tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. That's a big ouch. How do you handle that? Mm -hmm. Does that happen today? Do people talk back to God? Sure. Are they? Yeah. Are they are, I think we're real good at making bargains with God. Okay. We make bargains with Him. If I do this, will you do this for me? Do people uh, speak back to God when he tells them that they are to do and not to do? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe not literally with their mouth, but with their actions. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. You and I are included. You and I are included in that, in that collection. Mm -hmm. Now, you can search your own heart to find out whether or not you have or still are robbing God of what is due to him. I'm going to let that one lie on the table. How are the people robbing God? He tells them in your tithes and offerings. Right. Okay. And we discussed already that they were bringing, uh, either they were not bringing to the storehouse what they should have been bringing or what they right. brought were animals that were blemished or unclean or diseased. And animals they wouldn't themselves eat. No. So what happens if you don't pay your taxes? It doesn't seem like a question that belongs in here, but I'll tell you why it does in a minute. What happens if you don't pay your taxes? Well, you get charged interest, number be, one. Uh-huh. Uh, Can't you go to jail? Okay. Well, eventually, but the, uh, the IRS will seize your uh, assets, including your they'll house. Freeze, yeah, or they'll freeze. They'll freeze your. Uh, they'll put uh, on your paycheck if you are working. They'll uh, seize a certain amount of money or something. But uh, yeah, I don't know the the laws of uh, garnishment. Uh, garnishment. 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 Uh, so there are penalties if you don't pay your taxes. What yeah. if you don't? give to god what kind of penalties have do we have some kind of a sliding scale here if i only give a, a lesser part i'm being i'm being facetious aren't i yeah. you see robbing god is worse than not paying your taxes 
Yeah. And I, I, you know, the Lord hasn't changed his mind here. Uh, there uh, are freeloaders. You know, Pastor, my husband always used to say, pay your tax. This is the tax thing, not the God thing. And uh, if you don't, move to another country. And um, that was his kind of uh, ep thing. But um, what bothers me now is all these advertisements, we can get you out of paying your taxes. Yeah. You know, $100,000, we can get you down to five. And, and it just yeah. seems wrong. Well, in, uh, in, in Romans, it does tell us God does command us to pay unto Caesar what is owed to Caesar, I believe, also. so Romans 13, and also the Lord Jesus, uh, then he uh, tells Peter to go catch a fish, and I wish it were that easy to pay my taxes, yeah. and I find the coin in the fish's mouth, and I give that, oh, it's got Caesar's, uh, no, it has Washington's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, maybe uh, maybe you can send them some tomato juice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'd have to convert it to money by selling it in the marketplace. When uh, uh, Joanne, when your brother sent me the seeds, I don't think he realized I would uh, plant so many. And when he found out how many I was planting, he said, you're going to have enough to to satisfy the whole farmer's market. <laughs> well, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you <laughs> see that the Lord provides in such grand ways. Now, I'm going to bring up that I'm, it's not fair idea about the reduction. I feel the same about uh, when you have over $10,000 in debt, we can reduce that because you know that what's not paid is shared amongst the rest of us who do pay. So I don't know today, I don't think with the time rushing on and so many tangents, and your participation is grand, is wonderful. I love it. Um, you see, I don't have an agenda that we have to finish chapter three today. I, I could have if I just lectured the whole thing. There's only 30 slides here. Okay. Can you see that number in the lower right-hand corner? Yes. What does it say? 21. 21. 21. Okay. Well, the don't fair, it's not fair. We may get to it. So I want you to read Proverbs 3, 9, someone who hasn't read today, at least one of you, I think. I can read it. But please do. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Isn't that the same thing we were reading in mm. the bringing into the storehouse? Yeah. Right. Right. Now, when we do New Testament stewardship, we read 1 Corinthians 16. And what uh, I'm going to give you the brief story. I think some of you may remember it. There was a famine in Judea. And so uh, Paul and others went to the other churches which had been established and they began receiving offerings for the famine, for the people who were living in Judea to bring them. And it had to be money because you, well, the, the bringing of produce from Philippi, uh, it just was had. So they converted it to money and then they brought money. So when he wrote a letter to the Corinthians about the many problems that they had, he told them, let each one of you lay aside at the beginning of the week as God has prospered you. Yeah. You remember that passage? Lay aside at the beginning of the week. That's Sunday. Lay it aside each week. And just put it in a little collection there. And then I will receive it when I come. And so eventually he came to Corinth and he, he picked that up and it was, uh, he was not alone. So there was, you know, protection against fraud. I don't think Paul would have ever defrauded the Lord. I don't think he could have, but anyway, it was safe and he brought it to the starving uh, people in Judea. But he didn't want them to have to bring up, have a hasty collection when he came. 
So he said, lay it aside each week as God prospers you. And then when I get there, I'll pick it up and I'll, I'll take it because that's what uh, the Lord wants. And that's what uh, you, of course, want to respond, how you want to respond. You see how that first fruits giving was established in the Old Testament and St. Paul was continuing it on the first day of the week, lay aside. What is God? How has he given to you then this past week? Well, put it aside. First fruits giving is still a, a principle. Now, I don't know whether you do that literally anymore. When you sit down to write your checks to pay your bills for the month, I know a long time ago, boy, 20, 30 years, the pastor was saying, when you write your checks, write the yeah. check to the church first. That's your first fruits. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know. Think I don't think anybody's taking that literally. And if you give automatically, well, I guess it does go silently overnight electronically and whoop there it is <laughs> i uh, i don't know if you, you like that idea or not but when you honor the lord with your wealth where did it come from it, it, came, came, from. it came from him well give it back to him all right <laughs> so you you see the principle gets established Uh, back to Judy, uh, Malachi three ten. Okay, bring the full bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Wow, what a uh, promise! Mm -hmm. You're going to bring to me because you have faith that I will give you the rest. You see, when the farmer runs out there with, uh, what's the machine that, that, uh, that brings in the wheat? Thresher? The th the th the before Threshing the thresher. Or the combine, combine. Combine. Yeah. Combine. Reaper. Right. Combine. So, the threshing uh, machine is the, the old one. Yeah, so you go out there with that big machine and you, you pull in. So okay, you yeah. take you take the first that comes in and you give it to the Lord. Well, wait a minute, says the farmer. I don't know whether there's going to be more crops or not. No, just do it. Mm -hmm. And you're you're putting the Lord to the test. Now, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, that test idea. If you give me the first, I will give you the rest. Right. In fact... I will give you more. This is not prosperity gospel. Don't don't go away with this. Um, uh, I always get more from the Lord than he than I give him. So I'm going to I'm going to do this in order to get more from him. Uh oh, you get just got it, yourself into trouble because now you're using the Lord as a leverage to get more, and right. it's called coveting. No, here's a, a, a trust thing. I'm going to make a promise to you. And when you put the Lord to the test, there is a great prohibition against testing the Lord. He says so in so many words. Do not put me to the test. But here, it's not so much as a, a test. You know, I don't think the Lord will save me, but I'm going to run out there in the middle of traffic and see if he saves me. That's stupid. That's like the devil saying to the Lord, jump down from the temple because the Lord will send his holy angels. And Jesus says, it is written, thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to a test. That kind of test. This is a different test. This is a test of his promise. In fact, it's a faith trust. It's a faith test. If you believe with all your heart that I'm going to provide for you, give me the first fruits of your harvest and see if I won't. <laughs> I remember a pastor <laughs> speaking on this passage and he said, go and get all the bushel baskets you can. B bring them out to the harvest and you won't, you won't have enough bushel baskets to contain. This is in Wyoming. He is speaking. <laughs> and see if... I will not pour so much 
you won't be able to contain it all. This is a challenge. Mm. And there's a promise implied. What response does the Lord expect when he issues this kind of a promise? What response is he looking for when he says, trust me? Oh, I gave it away. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to say, test me. What is, the, what is the response to a promise from God? Every promise. He trusts you. Trust Pardon? He blesses you. In, and in, and in what, what's, what's the response in your heart? Faith. Faith. Okay, faith. Trust faith. me. So according to verse 11, how will the Lord accomplish this promise? Well, there's the first 11. Dee, would you read it? I will re read 311. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your cell. Oil. And your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Hmm. You know, that was always a threat. The crop would fail for reason of disease or... Uh, Frost. Frost. <laughs> All kinds of things can, can happen. But I'm going to make it so that hmm. your crops will not fail. That's a great promise. It's a big promise. It's still true today. Though most people don't think about it when they buy a loaf of bread. There are more than 20 taxes on a loaf of bread. Oh. Uh, if you figure out how little wheat is in that loaf, uh, go out and, and find out from the farmer how much he received for that much wheat. It's in the pennies, but the processing and transportation and taxes that are added to that wheat, well, that's the way we are in this economy. I can't fix that, and neither can you, unless you are making your own bread. The Lord warns the people not to speak against his will. We're running out of time, and we're not going to be able to cover this today because yeah. I want to keep the promise that we'll keep it to an hour. So I'm going to ask you to read the rest of chapter 3 of Malachi, and if you have time, go on into chapter 4. There are only four chapters, and I don't make any promises on how long we're going to spend on this. But I want to leave you some time. Um, if, you, if someone has a question or a comment they want to add before we get away from this. You're all pretty much satisfied with what you've learned today. As you know, I intend to, and I think I will still, I email you the slides that we had today. Right. And you can go over these passages, uh, take a little more time. Um, um, I'm going to ask a quick question, Pastor. When yes. we talk about first fruits and tithes and things, um, since all of us come from different backgrounds and different economic backgrounds, are we always referring to money or are we referring to also that uh, people can... Um, provide and give to like our church sponsors certain programs like the cross ministries where we bring right. food and canned goods and things like that or even is our is our time considered a tithe also yes. uh, all we, of your gifts to the church? lord whether given through trinity lutheran church and school or other uh, avenues of of aid to God and to his people. The Christian, the, to Christian organizations. The Christian organizations. Yeah, well, all of your gifts of help are, are, are given, but some of them are particularly given to the spread of the gospel of Jesus. And that's, right. that's the business we're in. I don't like to call it a business. That's the activity that God has called us to do. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter whether you preach or teach or give or sing or sweep the floor or make sure that the pews are sanitized for next week. Um, okay. I think they're doing that commercially. But 
this is the thing that you are giving to the Lord and to his work, and sometimes very indirectly. Long-winded answer to a short question, Judy, I'm sorry. Um, but all of these gifts, uh, Jeannie and I uh, help support a couple of seminary students mm -hmm. in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And it's a joy. It's a real joy. Mm -hmm. Because we know how hard it is, uh, having been through it. Uh, financially and other ways, you know, right. she has to work and they have small children. And so it, it just, it, it's really a, a challenge. So I, I, I want you to continue to give out of love for what the Lord has done for you as your response is both a response of faith and obedience. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I want to pray with you. And, um, and this is our prayer today. Uh, Lord God, you have given to us first. If you had not given to us, we, we could not return anything to you. But you have abundantly satisfied every one of our needs. Help us to distinguish between needs and wants because you never said you would satisfy all our wants. And then remember to, to remind us to return a portion of what you give us for the spread of the gospel of Jesus. Because we want what you want, Lord. We want other people to know him, to trust him, and to receive from him that wonderful gift of forgiveness. For it is in his name and because of him that we're able to pray to you, Father. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, where is it? Uh,